First, I'd like to thank everyone in the audience for coming today. I'd also like to thank the Mayor of South Windsor, Dr. Anwar, for hosting this much needed meeting. Most importantly, I'd like to thank Nick Scaglione, President of Concrete Research and Testing, for answering my letter and agreeing to come to Connecticut. Before I introduce Mr. Scaglione, I want to leave you with something to think about as you listen to our guest speaker. We hear a lot about the numbers involved in this crisis, the number of homes affected, the number of DCP complaints, the number of homes reassessed, the number of towns affected, the number of tax losses, and the number of homes that are sitting on the real estate market unable to sell. But we haven't been able to put these numbers into perspective. Sources state there could be the propensity of 33,000 homes, 34,000, or even as high as 38 homes that could be affected. And we know the state of Connecticut has legislated two funding mechanisms available to homeowners in the near future. The captive's 100 million and the surcharge's 100 million to be dispersed at approximately 30 million per year with the average cost to repair at 200,000. At 33,000 homes and the 200,000 average, this crisis is a 6,600,000. You divide that by 330 million, it's going to take 220 years to rectify. At 34,000 homes, 200,000 the average, it's a 6,800,000. Divide that by 30 million, and it's 226 years to rectify. Lastly, at 38,000 homes, 200,000 to fix, it's a 7,600,000 dollar crisis, divide that by 30 million, and it's 253 years to rectify this crisis. With a total population of approximately 3,573,701 citizens in the nine regions of Connecticut, this crisis affects 23 of the 38 towns in the capital region, the largest and most populated region in Connecticut, and 13 of the 16 towns in the northeast region which equates to approximately one million citizens in just two of the nine regions. These numbers cannot be ignored. The magnitude and economic impact cannot be sustained by our state alone. We need the federal government to step in and provide financial help. After three years of research, I have come to the realization there are no safety nets for this type of crisis. No homeowner's insurance, no construction warranty pools, no CUTPA, no FEMA, at a propensity of 38,000 homes damaged and the hands of our government agencies tied because there are no laws broken by not having a standard, are we not leaving ourselves vulnerable for this happening again? We need a study that brings us standards. We need to have the University of Connecticut finish what they started in 2016 when they investigated the underlying cause of failing foundation. We need to protect the citizens of Connecticut by regulating these sulfide minerals. The only way to know what percent is injurious to aggregate, how to interpret core test results, how to stage homes in line for repair funding, and identify homes that have harmless paratite versus reactive paratite is by having this study done here in Connecticut. This study would put these numbers into perspective. There are 3,573,701 citizens in Connecticut, and the study the University of Connecticut has proposed would cost approximately 28 cents per citizen. Are we really willing to wait for the national government to set a standard after waiting three years already? Doesn't the lawmakers owe the citizens of Connecticut protection when we have no safety nets? municipal leaders, legislators, and our federal delegation. You've worked hard in the last three years to address this crisis, and today you're being asked to listen and learn about what type of paratite we are dealing with in Connecticut from an Ohio geologist who's reported on our crisis since 2008. With that said, I give you Nick Scaglione. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, thanks for having me. I just want to, I hope I don't, it's kind of a small room. I don't know if I really need to use that. Um, do but, because we are showing it all across. Oh, us. yes. Okay. That's to. true. Oh, that's good. This one. Uh, so I want to start off by, again, uh, thanking Debbie McCoy, uh, who's responsible for getting me out here for this presentation. 
Um, also, like to thank Linda Tofaleski for, for driving me around and, and showing me some of the, uh, the distressed concrete. And as Debbie did, uh, thank you, Dr. Anwar, for, for hosting this event. Uh, can we turn the lights down to get, because you're, you're not going to be able to see. Okay, so as my title says, understanding the concrete pier type problem. Uh, I'm probably getting several calls a week um, these days from either homeowners, home buyers, real estate agents, testing labs, uh, calling about this problem. I find myself explaining what I've learned over and over again. So uh, it's good to be able to, to be here and, and uh, present what I, what I found out in my work. Okay. It's the arrows here. Ooh. The arrows won't. Uh... This should do it, right? Okay, this is working now. Okay, so I'm sure far too many of you have seen way too many of these uh, foundations with this very severe cracking distress, uh, typically a, a pattern cracking, uh, often have a horizontal orientation of the cracking. You can see some very wide cracking. Also, the, uh, the, the white efflorescence uh, that you commonly see, commonly see indicating uh, moisture movement uh, through that wall from the exterior. Uh, when the moisture moves through there, it's, it's dissolving out soluble components. And when that water evaporates at the interior surface of the wall, uh, those uh, soluble components then crystallize on the surface when that water evaporates and you know, forms this, this efflorescence. Uh, you know, you're also getting some bowing of these walls, and, and of course you're not just getting the distress in the uh, foundation walls, but it's affecting things up in the home with, with cracking drywall, doors out of misalignment, and from what I understand, even in cracked windows and, and things like that are occurring uh, in the house. Okay, so my involvement, the first cores I received were in 2008, and that was with the uh, Basewitz case, which went all the way to trial. Uh, since that time, I, I've examined over 325 cores, uh, represents probably over 160 different cases, getting different amounts of cores from each, anywhere from one core to four or five cores per, per residence. Uh, we also looked at the, in some cases, some concrete floor slabs, cores from floor slabs, and I'll kind of talked about uh, what we learned from that and the importance of that. Um, and you can see all the different uh, work we've done for everyone as far as insurance companies and law firms and contractors, testing labs, real estate agents, homeowners, home buyers. Uh, so these are all the cores I looked at that had the contained reactive aggregate. Um, and just a chart showing where they came from. So you can see Tolland uh, is the and in in the course that I received, the most heavily affected at you know, over 26 cases, then, then South Windsor, um, Ellington, Willington, Sapphire Springs are all uh, common that I received cores from. Okay, so before we get started in, in discussing the whole pyrotite issue, I wanted to talk about just what is concrete petrography. So when these cores are being taken and sent to a laboratory that they're, they're getting petrographic work on, what does that mean? What are, what are the petrographers doing? Uh, so petrography is it's a term taken from geology. It's a, the systematic classification uh, of rocks, or description and systematic classification of rocks. And um, in concrete, concrete's pretty much man-made rock. You've, you've got uh, the aggregate, about 75% of the concrete is comprised of the aggregate. You have the coarse aggregate, which is either a crushed stone or, or a natural gravel. And, um, and the fine aggregate, typically a, a natural sand. And even the, the port and cement is made from rocks. It's made from limestone and shale uh, with a little bit of uh, gypsum added to control the set of the cement. So it, it's, it's not surprising that most concrete petrographers have a geology background. Um, there is an ASTM standard uh, for performing a petrographic examination. It's ASTM C856. And that's the standard practice for petrographic examination of hardened concrete. There's a, they do have a qualification section, and it talks in there about the, how Petrographers should have uh, courses in petrology, mineralogy, and optical mineralogy. 
Okay, so the first step, of course, is getting the cores from the foundation. Uh, so we typically recommend two cores, you know, at least one from a back wall and a, and a front wall, and, and a four-inch diameter core, and the core taken all the way through the foundation. Uh, that's what I recommend, and, and the reason why we want a, a four-inch diameter core and taken all the way through, one reason is to have enough aggregate to look at. When we cut a section through that core, uh, we're going to want to be able to count a significant number of aggregate particles uh, to get a statistically significant number um, as far as how much reactive aggregate is in there. And um, if you have a, a small diameter core, it's only taken part, part way through, you're just not going to have enough aggregate particles to look at. Uh, but the other reason to take it all the way through and below grade is to be able to look at the uh, moisture barrier, if there is a moisture barrier, on the other side of the, the wall. Um, a lot of those older homes that we've received cores from back in the 80s either had no moisture barrier or it was a poor quality material that was allowing moisture in. So when we took that, uh, looked at that moisture barrier in the lab, put water drops on it, it kind of sat there for maybe a little bit, but then eventually, within minutes, it just started soaking in and, and absorbing into that moisture barrier. Not all the most newer homes, um, the, the codes have changed and, and now it's required. So typically on any of these newer homes past the late 90s and 2000s, typically have a good quality uh, bituminous moisture barrier. But um, it, it's, it's, you know, if a homeowner is getting his test done, it's good for them to know if they have that, you know, that moisture barrier is there and if it's a good quality product. So once the core is received in the lab, this uh, picture just shows how we cut that core. So we're taking a section all the way through from one end to the other. Uh, you can see that the, um, the lower picture on the right shows uh, the exterior of the wall with the, with the bituminous uh, moisture coating material. Okay, so this is a, uh, a saw cut lap section. That's when, once we cut that section out, um, when, it, when it's first saw cut, it's a pretty rough surface. And we're going to uh, lap that surface to get a nice smooth surface like you, like you see here so you can actually see all the details of the, of the cracking and the aggregate and you're able to uh, distinguish what you're looking at. Um, this is a, uh, a core that was from a, uh, with reactive aggregate with a severely, uh, had severe cracking distress. So that lapping procedure is just um, taking that core and, and uh, going through a, some diamond, a diamond pad and silicon carbide grit. Uh, that's just a, a steel lapping wheel. Uh, and you work through a series of coarse grit to a very fine grit to get a, a smooth lap surface. It's kind of like polishing. We don't quite, we can go to a polishing steps, but we don't always do that. Uh, just to show, show some of the microscopes in my laboratory. And individually, this is a, uh, a stereo microscope. Uh, so you can see a section of concrete on the table there to be examined. We got a, uh, a fiber optic. Uh, light source there, and all the microscopes are fixed with cameras, and what you're looking at there is on, on the, up on the screen. Uh, so we, we use a screen, all, all our work we're pretty much looking under the microscope, we use a screen to show if we have guests come in or if we're trying to show employees something, we can show things up on the, on the monitor, but we also use that for uh, uh, when we're taking photographs, whatever we see in that uh, up on the monitor is what's going to be in the photograph. So all our reports were typically taking uh, photographs under the microscope to show what's going on. Okay, so that stereo microscope you saw goes up to a magnification of anywhere from 3.5 to about 140x. And if we want to look at things in, at higher magnification and a little more, little more detail, we can make concrete thin sections. Uh, so you mount a piece of the concrete that you're interested in to a glass slide, cut it to a thickness of about half a millimeter and grind it down to about 25 microns which is thin enough that you can pass light through it um, and, and, and see through that. And you, you need to be able to see through it because it's uh, examined on a, uh, a petrographic microscope or a transmitted light microscope. So that light source is in the bottom and needs to, to, to transmit through that, that slide. And this is a microscope that geologists are trained on to uh, be able to identify minerals. All the minerals have different optical properties, so you can use those opti optical properties to identify uh, all the different minerals, they all look differently under the petrographic microscope. And then you can identify the rock if you know the minerals in the rock. And this microscope goes up to, uh, well, 
We've got objectives that go up to 500 or even 1,000x on this. Typically, we don't go much above 500. Uh, so that just shows the, the cement paste under a petrographic microscope. We can actually see individual cement particles. So all those dark particles are, are Portland cement particles. This is a, uh, a scanning electron microscope. So if we want to go look a little deeper and actually look at the chemistry of things, we can use a scanning electron microscope, which is uh, affixed with a uh, EDX detector back here. And so not only can you look at things at very high power, uh, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 X, uh, you can determine the elemental composition of whatever you're looking at. Uh, so you can bring an image up on the, on the monitor and uh, draw a little area around a particular area you want to analyze or, or a dot on a certain crystal, and it'll give you the elemental composition so you can determine what the, what the chemistry is. So it's a very powerful tool um, used in concrete petrography when, it, when it's necessary. Uh, this is just a image, kind of see what, uh, this is some secondary deposits taken at 2000, two, yeah, 2000 X, it's actually some uh, crystallized ASR gel, and all these images in the SEM are uh, in grayscale, uh, black and white, although you can uh, then do compositional mapping and assign different elements, different colors, so you can get some images that look like this where the, uh, all the red crystals are uh, brucite, magnesium hydroxide, the blue crystals are calcite, calcium carbonate. And getting back to the, uh, the pyrotide issue, uh, this is that we talked about that efflorescence. Uh, whenever we analyze that, it's uh, sodium sulfate or the mineral phenardite. And the crystals don't look this nice when you scrape that stuff off the wall and, and look at it under the SEM. But in this case, we actually dissolved uh, that material, um, put it on an, in, water, in water, put it on a glass slide, let that water evaporate, and then these crystals formed. So that's what these, uh, the sodium sulfate crystals look like. Okay, so this is a, a section of concrete from 1985. And what I did was, under the microscope, traced all of the cracks in black ink. So you can see uh, the amount of cracking and, and where the cracking is occurring. And then I also marked each of the particles that are reacting and expanding with the, with the yellow X. And you can see that a lot of these cracks are extending from each of these reactive aggregate particles. Um, so these aren't the only particles that contain pyrotite. Some of these dark particles, I think this one here, some of these darker particles also contain pyrotite. But you know, after, after 30 years, what we're seeing, we're seeing in these particles marked with the X, we're seeing uh, pyrotite in there. We're seeing a lot of, a lot of oxidation of the pyrotite um, and fracturing of the aggregate and those cracks going into the cement paste. Um, but the, these other rock particles that contain some pyrotite also, um, the pyrotite in those are uh, fresh, unoxidized. They're typically smaller particles, kind of dispersed more evenly through the particle. But that rock, it's much denser than the reactive rock. So we have different types of rocks here that both contain pyrotite. Some, it's very obvious that some are reacting, while others are not. And that's one reason why this, this, this situation in Connecticut here is a little more difficult because we have these, uh, some of these rocks that contain pyrotite but don't really seem to be reacting. Um, so I'm usually, one thing I typically do is uh, go through and, and, like I said before, we have a whole section and counting the particles and, and which ones are, are reactive and which ones aren't, how many contain pyrotite. Uh, so on all the older foundations, um, as you'll see, you know, a real typical value was anywhere from 25 to 45 percent of the of the uh, of the aggregate uh, of the coarse aggregate contained these rocks that are judged to be reactive. Um, but we've seen uh, severely cracked foundations with amounts as low as 21 percent reactive aggregate. Um, but now, that, now we don't know. That doesn't mean you're not going to get severe deterioration at. 15% or 10%. That's, that's what we don't know yet because all these older foundations, the pyrotite content was typically higher. And sometimes uh, we'll talk about in these newer foundations, uh, we're seeing lower amounts of reactive pyrotite. But then you also have all these particles here 
that uh, these lighter colored particles, they just contain no pyrotite. Okay, so we have reactive aggregate, right, that uh, most of which we, has come from the, from the Becker quarry. A lot of these cores I'm looking at, um, in some situations they will tell me, yes, we know this came from the Becker quarry. A lot of times they don't have the records, they don't know. But I've looked at enough of them uh, that said, yes, these are you know, from the Becker quarry that uh, you have a good understanding of, of pretty much what that aggregate looks like. And this is a, uh, a coarse aggregate that's used in this area that is, that is not reactive. It's a, it's a diabase. So if you have this type of rock in, in your foundation, uh, you're, you're in good shape. We typically see uh, trace amounts of, of pyrite in this rock, and, uh, but no, no pyrotite. Uh, this is a, another coarse aggregate that I commonly see in some of these foundations that, uh, that aren't reacting. It's a, a, a gravel. You can see the particles. Uh, whereas in here, it's a crushed stone uh, quarried from a, a, you know, a rock face, and then they crush up the rock. So all the particles are, are angular. Whereas this is a gravel, so a lot of the particles are, are rounded because this is a, a, a gravel that's been in, uh, transported over time and through glaciers, and it's uh, just been weathered. Um, but anyway, this particular uh, gravel, we'll, we, we might just see a trace amount of pyrotite or a trace amount of pyrite or maybe a little bit of calcopyrite um, in, in a particle or two, but noth nothing really significant. Okay, so this is a crushed stone from the Becker Quarry, and from the Becker, they, they not only do they, they supply crushed stone, but they also supply uh, gravel. So, like I said, this is a, a crushed stone. Again, there's uh, reactive particles in here, and there's also uh, non-reactive particles, and some pyrotite-bearing particles that are that are non-reactive. Uh, so, this is a, a gravel uh, from the Becker Quarry, and it, it's interesting. Unlike that last gravel, there seems to be a lot more of these, you see all these dark angular particles. So those particles look more like a crushed stone. Um, I'm not sure, I doubt if they were, uh, it's possible that they were combining some of their gravel and their crushed stone, but it could also be that the gravel, some of the gravel particles are very large, very large cobbles, and those are being uh, crushed down. So you get, the, you get a combination of rounded uh, weathered particles and some, some angular particles. So a lot of these uh, lighter particles, you know, a lot of these particles contain no iron sulfides. Um, some of them contain iron sulfides that, uh, or pyrotite uh, that have a typical composition where it lends it to be reactive, and then some contain pyrotite again that, that don't seem to be reacting. Okay, so... So what we end up with is, you know, you've got a, a few different situations when these cores are being taken. You've got these cores that obviously have the, 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 the Becker aggregate, the poor quality rock, and the concrete, it's an older foundation, and there's severe cracking running all through it, and so it's very obvious there's a, there's a major concern there. Uh, then you have these other situations where you've, like I showed you with the non-reactive aggregate, the, the diabase or that non-reactive gravel, where there's no reactive uh, material, and there's no, there's no pyrotite, so there's no, there's no problem with those aggregates. Um, and then, unfortunately, we've got a lot of these, these gray areas, specifically on these newer homes. Um, let me see here. No, I'll get, okay, I'll get that in a minute. Um, where the pyrotite, the amount of reactive aggregate is, is a lot lower. And we're seeing... In general, we're seeing a reduction of amount of aggregate over time. And so a lot of these newer foundations, the, instead of the, the, the reactive amount of coarse aggregate particles in that, in that coarse aggregate being 30 or 40 percent, we're seeing values of 15, 10, or, or 5 percent. And 
Compounded with that is the fact that now these, these newer homes also have a good quality moisture barrier, so no moisture is getting in. Um, so what we don't know is will these foundations with these low amounts of reactive rock and very, either none or very little moisture getting in, are they going to be a problem in the future? And that's something that needs to be, needs to be figured out. Um, so I just wanted to get, that's just a core from a, uh, a floor slab. Just wanted to show that's, a, again, a reactive uh, rock in that. Um, this is, it's not a very good quality image. It was, uh, this, this is a concrete section from Canada uh, that I received from a professor at Laval University. And you know, a lot of times people want to kind of, they've done a lot of work at, at, uh, in Canada on their, on their aggregates and, and want to kind of look to what, what they've done and, and use some of their information. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what the, the work they've done. But one thing is, is their aggregate is, is, is different from ours. Um, so there may not be able to, you know, we need to do work looking at this particular aggregate because their aggregate does contain pyrotite and it's reactive, but you can see it's much more uniform. Um, most of the particles um, contain pyrotite. They don't have a situation where there's a lot of particles that contain none or, or contain pyrotite that are a different rock type like we have in, in uh, Connecticut here. Um, so it's just, it's just a, unfortunately, it's a, it's, a, it's a different situation, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So what is the composition of the, the reactive aggregate, the ones that we're seeing? They're obviously, uh, the pyrotite is oxidizing, and then the rocks are expanding. The rock type is, is basically a granitic gneiss or a schist, and those are just different uh, amounts of, of metamorphism in the rock, with the schist being more metaf uh, metamorphosed than a, than a gneiss, but they're granitic in composition, uh, and, and the basic composition of, of a granite is, is quartz, feldspar, and biotite. Oh, I also just wanted to mention that we, yeah, we typically see a lot more of the granitic gneiss. Uh, we, we always see a small number of schist particles, but it's mostly uh, the granitic gneiss. Um, the reactive particles typically contain a lot of garnet, and that's one thing when we, we see the garnet. It's just real typical of the reactive rock. Um, sometimes uh, this, these rocks are referred to as a garnetiferous granitic night because there's so much garnet. Um, they often contain uh, another mineral, selimonite and, and graphite, and occasionally some pyroxene minerals. So it's a pretty complex rock. Um, of course, they contain minor to small amounts of pyrotite. Uh, when we did, on, on one of them, we actually did a, a point count and on just the reactive rocks to measure the percentage of pyrotite in, that, in those reactive rocks, and it came out to about 3%. Um, but I, I, in some cases, I think it uh, runs higher than that. Uh, and, and in some cases, we see individual rock particles that have 25% more of pyrotite in these, in these individual rock particles, and I'll show some examples of that. And they uh, typically also contain... Uh, minor amounts of some other uh, iron oxide, I mean, I'm sorry, um, iron sulfide minerals, pyrite, calcopyrite, and pentlandite. And this is just a list of the, the other rock types that we see in the Becker aggregate. Um, one thing I, I meant to mention back when we were looking at those, uh, the gravel aggregate from Becker versus the crushed stone. The gravel, since it has, it's more variable and you probably notice the color difference in all those other different rock types in there. So the gravel, the gravels typically have a lower amount of reactive aggregate, but there's, there's plenty of reactive aggregate in there. The other thing with the gravel is sometimes I've heard people say, well, if it's, if it's gravel, it, it shouldn't be a problem because that rock's already been exposed to the environment for all this time. Um, and we do see uh, in, in the gravel, we do see in many cases that the, there was pyrotite that's oxidized prior to that concrete, um, prior to that, that aggregate being incorporated into the concrete. Um, but there's still unoxidized pyrotite on the interior of the particles. They're still available to react. So these, these gravels, you know, definitely uh, will cause problems. Um, so, we, like I said, I know it's been uh, oxidized in some situations uh, prior to being in the, into the concrete because I've seen these gravels in some of these newer foundations, and there's absolutely no cracking in that concrete. But you see a lot of oxidation going on in these particles. And that's because it was, like I said, in nature, and it was, it was oxidation going on prior to being incorporated into the concrete. 
Okay, so I just put this chart together showing when, I, when we are doing those, those counts of the amount of reactive aggregate in the coarse aggregate, the amount of reactive aggregate particles in the coarse aggregate. Um, just put a chart showing the percent of reactive aggregate particles that we're counting uh, versus the year. And you can see there's a, a major trend of that going down. A lot of these newer uh, foundations don't have the amount of reactive aggregate like we were seeing in the, in the uh, early 80s uh, to, and, and to mid-90s. And you can, of course, see, like everyone's reported, eight, 1983. Everything we've got has been 1983 and beyond. Uh, so, you know, why is this trend going down? I'm not exactly sure. I, 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 it could be that the, uh, in, the, in the Becker Quarry, over time, that as they were mining back further in the quarry, they were getting more out of the reactive rock. Um, it could be they're quarrying one end and now they're over to another end and that rock is different from one end to the other. Uh, that's what, one thing I don't know. It's one, th one reason why I would really would love to be able to get to that quarry and, 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 and look at how the, everything is laid out in there and try to help understand why, you know, what's, what's going on here. Okay, so this just shows the, uh, the iron sulfide minerals we're dealing with. Uh, pyrite up there on the upper left, which uh, people may be a little more familiar with. I'm sure that uh, no one really even ever heard of the mineral pyrotite before all this happened. Uh, but again, pyrite's a little more common mineral that people may be aware of. And uh, we, we see problems with, with pyrite in our, our gravels causing pop-outs in, in pavements and walls and rust stains. Uh, but then... We also see, like I said, a little bit of calcopyrite. And you get all these uh, great colors in the, in the calcopyrite. That's a copper iron sulfide. And we see a little bit uh, of pentlandite, which is an iron nickel sulfide. And then, of course, the, uh, the pyrotite, whereas pyrite is FES2, pyrotite is typically FES, or sometimes the, uh, you have a little less uh, iron to sulfur, so that's why you get that Fe1 minus X in the, in the uh, equation there. So during our, our, our initial work, we made uh, thin sections of the aggregate to help identify you know, the, the different minerals in there. And so these are all labeled. All these colorful minerals are the mineral biotite. It's a mica. Uh, these striated minerals over here are a feldspar. And then all these white and gray dark minerals here are quartz. And then all the black, that's all the, uh, the pyrotite. And the reason that's black is because it's a, it's a metallic mineral, it's an opaque mineral, so light doesn't, even, even at that 25 micron thickness, the, uh, the light does not pass through uh, these minerals. But you can actually look at it under the petrographic microscope with uh, reflected light and differentiate some of the different uh, opaque minerals that are in there. Just another thin section slide showing the, the garnet that has a higher relief. Again, you get all the brownish biotite and the pyrotite. And we often see the pyrotite in, in close uh, proximity to the, the biotite. It's often in between and, and, and uh, associated with the biotite often. And just one more uh, thin section. Just Like I said, some of these have very high amounts of garnet, and we'll look at other pictures also uh, under the stereo microscope where you can see that. So all the, the light-colored area is all garnet, and we have bio biotite and pyrotite. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the the distress mechanisms, of course, with any oxidation of a metallic mineral or, me or metal like steel, uh, when it oxidizes or rusts, you get expansion. Uh, that's why a lot of times you see potholes and, on, on, on bridge decks because the steel in there is, is corroding and expanding and cracking the concrete. And uh, So uh, these, these iron sulfide minerals do the same thing when they oxidize. They expand, and you, you were able to see that from those pictures with that, where the cracks are just going right from the reactive particles and, and cause this cracking. Um, with, this, uh, with the release of the, the sulfur uh, during the uh, oxidation, uh, anytime concrete's exposed to sulfur or sulfates, you can get uh, sulfate attack, and that's where you have uh, these expansive minerals forming in the cement paste, and that also causes expansion. You can actually form uh, etringite and thomasite uh, within the cement paste, 
and that reaction is, is expansive, so that can also cause some expansion. Uh, when we did our initial work, where we were doing a lot more detailed work, uh, we looked for evidence of sulfate attack with the SCM, didn't really see evidence of the uh, of, of sulfate attack in, in that case. Uh, since that time, I've examined cores where it seems to be pretty obvious there is sulfate attack going on, although well, I haven't really done the, uh, the SEM and the chemistry work to con confirm that. But they, in, in Canada, of course, they've done a lot of work, and, and they're, they're showing that uh, a lot of the uh, expansion is due to uh, this sulfate attack and, and particularly the formation of thomasite. Uh, the Yukon study also showed uh, uh, formation of uh, these expansive minerals in, in their study. And you can also get uh, sulfuric acid attack with the, when the, uh, uh, with the oxidation of the, uh, these iron sulfide minerals. So I just want to talk a little bit about the, the acceleration of the stress. In most of the projects that I was involved with, uh, the homeowners reported not seeing any cracking on the exterior of the wall to about 15 years. Um, I've talked to other people since I've been here, and they're saying, well, you, you can't get cracking a lot earlier than that. But regardless, you really see an acceleration of the, uh, of the cracking once it starts. Once you start, I mean, of course, even if they saw the cracking on the exterior wall after 15 years, I mean, there, there's cracking has been going on inside of that concrete for probably a, a good bit longer. And there was probably cracks on the outside of that concrete even, you know, a good bit before they saw them, but they were very tight and they probably just weren't noticed. Uh, but then, you know, by, by 20 years, they've, they've got cracks that you can stick your finger in. They're just, you know, incredibly, you get, get, get this acceleration of the distress, which is, uh, which makes sense because once you start getting the cracking, you're going to allow more moisture to get in. And of course, water is very important. We'll, we'll talk about that. But also, the cracking is opening up these reactive particles and exposing more pyrotite. Um, so you just, it just compounds itself. So once it starts, it just accelerates and you get this... Uh, uh, increase in uh, the rate of distress. Okay, so I've got a whole bunch of photographs like this showing the aggregate particles under the microscope. Uh, I'll try to get through them kind of quickly, but this just shows the uh, uh, one of these reactive aggregate particles. You can see the pink garnet in there and the cracking kind of extending out different ways and kind of the some of the deterioration in here. So there's uh, oxidized pyrotite in there. Uh, another example of just the, uh, the typical reactive rock particle uh, expanding and causing the cracking. Uh, this is a uh, rock particle that there was, actually this was a one taken from the floor slab. There wasn't really any uh, oxidation of the, of the pure type going on. So you see this kind of gold type color shown by the yellow arrows. All the black is the, the biotite in there. Then here's one where, uh, you know, closer up uh, view where you can see uh, this, the gold pyrotite is now kind of this rust colored because of the uh, significant oxidation. And another example of that, just very rusty, brown looking color from the, from the oxidation of the pyrotite. Uh, so I've got some images that are taken with a little bit of a different light, so the pyrotite looks a little different. We've got the um, fiber optic, kind of the gooseneck where you can put it down at a low angle, and you can kind of see more of the relief. Um, this is taken with a ring light, and I'll show you the, 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 the difference there. But all these red arrows are pointing, again, to this pyrotite all through the, through the rock. This one, doesn't, you can see, doesn't really contain much garnet. And so this was taken back, again, with the, uh, uh, the light shown at a, at, a, at a... Oh, I'm sorry. No, this is the, um, taken with the ring light. And just to kind of show you the difference, when you go to there... To there, so a lot of these particles, oops, that I'm showing, may be a little more deteriorated looking, uh, but since they're taken with the with the ring light, you can't see some of that some of that deterioration. Okay. Okay. So again, one of these, uh, and one one thing you'll you'll notice from from picture to picture is these rocks. <clears throat> all these are reactive rocks, but they, they a lot of them will will look a lot. Different from the, from the other. Again, you see this one has a lot of garnet. All these uh, pink minerals. Uh, the silver mineral here is the graphite. Uh, the dark minerals are biotite. And there's pyrotite, really all through this here, here, here. Just really all the way through all those little gold-looking 
uh, particles. And we also see some finer aggregate particles. This is all pyrotite right here in a, in a, in a finer aggregate process. We haven't seen a lot of <coughs> uh, distress associated with some of these finer particles. So again, another particle just showing a, a really high amount of, of garnet, and there's all this is, is oxidized pyrotite. This is really oxidized, where these really is kind of brown colored here. Uh, just a good picture kind of showing the, the, the cracking extending from uh, different directions out, out of that reacted particle. This is all reacted pyrotite in here. Again, all these minerals here. This is all the uh, oxidized pyrotite. You kind of see it here, good, kind of the gold color. And, you know, a lot of these have different textures um, in individual particles. Uh, we're gonna, so this, this particle here, <clears throat> I'm going to just zoom in on that area there to kind of see a little better. Okay, and um, again, there's, there's uh, oxidized pyrotite all through there, so a little closer. All these brown minerals in here are all the oxidized pyrotite. And uh, some severely oxidized pyrotite there. And again, just look at, you know, just in this individual particle, you got different texture over here and different mineralogy uh, than you do on the other side. Just to zoom in, again, you can see that severe, significant oxidation. Uh, this is a particle here that contains pyrotite. And one of these ones that aren't really reacting, you can see all the pyrotite's pretty gold. Um, some, we'll, I'll show you some more of these darker particles here that uh, uh, don't really seem to be reacting. This one here has got this large band of, of pyrotite right here that's oxidizing. And like I said, some of these particles are, are schist. Most of those particles I just showed you were more, more of a granitic, nice texture, whereas this, these are more of a schist texture. You see more um, uh, layering and, and, and linear uh, minerals in there. And actually zooming in on this area right up here. You can see all this uh, pyrotite. And when you see these striations, that's an indication that it's oxidizing. And I'll show you some better examples of that. But all these, this is all the, the pyrotite here. And you see all those striations indicating the, the oxidation of the mineral. <clears throat> uh, just another example of a uh, schist particle here, more of a granitic nice particle here. This is all pyrotite there. Uh, again, the particle just got <clears throat> a varying texture with this more of this schist area here, and all this dark brown is oxidized pyrotite. You can see some gold pyrotite here in the in the center. <clears throat> and it's another highly metamorphosed rock. The red arrows are pointing to all this kind of striated, oxidizing pyrotite, and you can see individual small little pyrotite particles from the sand. Uh, this <clears throat> rock shows some chalcopyrite in, this, in that area right, right here, and we'll, we'll zoom in on that so you can see those, those in this case, a blue color of the, uh, of the chalcopyrite, and some of that is, is oxidizing. Um, some more chalcopyrite. I just, I just put this in there because I thought it looked like a little owl's head. Um, but this is a, the blue is a chalcopyrite. Um, there's some graphite up here in the ear, and then... Uh, most of this uh, here is probably oxidized pyrotite. <clears throat> is that pyrotite actually part of the shunt? Just the rock itself? It's a, yeah, it's in the rock, yeah. I mean, it's... And, um, and what... Because <laughs> he just mentioned um, pyrotite, and that's one thing that... Every, everyone I talk to, they always want to call the, the mineral pyrotite. I don't know if that comes from thinking of pyrite, but, but it's actually... The uh, correct pronunciation is pyrotite. So the, the mineral is uh, pyrotite that we're concerned with. Uh, so this, this here shows a little bit of the uh, petlandite, this golder colored mineral. Um, the mineral here with the, the, the scratches is, is uh, pyrotite, and we also have some, some pyrite. And one thing that's, um, even though these, these minerals kind of look similar, uh, we can easily when we're looking at them petrographically, we determine if we're looking at pyrotite versus pyrite, um, because pyrotite is softer. 
than pyrite. Uh, pyrotite has a Mohs hardness about four, where pyrite has a Mohs hardness of about six. So if you get a Mohs hardness probe of five, you can scratch the pyrotite and you can't scratch the, the pyrite. So that's one test. You can also just pluck a little bit out, get a magnet, see if it's mag mag magnetic. The, uh, the uh, pyrotite is magnetic where pyrite is not. So I told you about some of these particles that have more than 25% uh, pyrotite. This rock particle here, it's a coarse aggregate particle. There's, there's two millimeters there. Um, and about probably 75% or more of that coarse aggregate particle is, is comprised of pyrotite. <clears throat> you see a little bit of garnet in there. And we're going to zoom up and take a closer look at this particle. So again, you can see this more of the gold-colored, unreactive uh, pyrotite. And then on the exterior edge, it's, it's oxidizing more. And just to zoom in on that, again, you can see uh, the striated uh, pyrotite near the exterior, all this through here, indicating the oxidation and even the brown color at the very edge where in here it's not, not so much. Another particle where, you know, at least half the particle is, is all pyrotite. <clears throat> and then you have the garnet and mica there on the other half. And you got to remember these, you know, this is all mined from large rock, and these are just individual particles that are being crushed, and there's just a lot of variety in this, in this rock. <clears throat> Another particle that's probably, you know, 30% pyrotite, all this here is pyrotite, and highly oxidized here, starting to oxidize over here. This is another particle showing a very high amount of, of pyrotite, you know, probably 30 percent. This, this, and this particle is all just pyrotite, graphite, all the silver, and, and biotite. So a lot of, again, a lot of variety in, these, uh, in the composition. Another one with a very high amount of pyrotite. You can see the, the significant oxidation down here. But all this, all through here, that pyrotite is, is oxidizing. <clears throat> Like I said, we, you can see some of these individual pyrotite particles in sand. We don't really often see much uh, problem or, you know, much cracking related to these. Um, just a coarse aggregate particle there. But sometimes you see the fine aggregate particles that have more of the, uh, just, it just looks like a smaller of a coarse aggregate particle with a lot of the different uh, uh, minerals in there. Uh, I've got a few more of these, but this is mostly uh, pyrite on this particle. So like I said, we typically see only very small amounts of, of pyrite, almost the, the, probably more than typically 95% of the, of the iron sulfide minerals in there are pyrotite with, like I said, these other pyrite and uh, pyrite would be next most common and, and then pentlandite and calc calcopyrite. Um, but this is almost all pyrite. That right there is pyrotite though, and that's oxidized pyrotite. Um, so that's kind of a little unusual to have these, uh, this uh, larger sample of pyrite in there. Um, so this was a, a, an unusual particle because this here is what I was talking about is, is typically the non-reactive pyrotite bearing uh, coarse aggregate particle. But this is the first one I've seen where a portion of the particle is actually has the, the reactive, more of the reactive composition and texture. Um, but you can see in the non-reactive, you typically get these small particles of pyrotite, all these light colored particles kind of dispersed throughout the rock. I'll just show examples, a few examples of that type of rock again. And like I said, it's a much more uh, dense rock and it, it seems to me that the moisture is not able to get in there to cause this, uh, this pyrotite to oxidize. So, you know, we're seeing in these rocks non-oxidized pyrotite, whereas when we look at a rock, you know, right next to it, that has the, the other texture and mineralogy we talked about that's it's allowing moisture in, uh, they're, they're reacting. And these, these other rocks, all these ones I just showed you that were uh, reactive, they typically have uh, mica, uh, uh, high area, um, amounts of mica, and mica is kind of a sheet mineral uh, where water can kind of get in between that. Also, if you notice, all, almost all the garnet is typically highly fractured. Um, so that's allowing moisture in. Uh, the selenite is kind of a, a needle-like uh, habit, and, and it allows moisture in too. So the rocks that uh, are, are reacting are just allowing more moisture in than these non-reactive rocks. 
again, just examples of these uh, uh, pyrotite containing non reactive uh, grenadic nice particles. Another, same thing. Uh, and, and then we've got these uh, other rock particles that just contain no pyrotite. A lot of quartzites and um, granitic rocks uh, that just are in some of, some of these particles, uh, the rock types are in the, the crushed stone, but we see a lot more of these in the, in the gravels. But the, you know, a lot of them are just, this is a, a granitic nice particle that just has no uh, pyrotite or any iron sulfide minerals. Just a few more examples of those. The granitic nice, you still got some garnet, um, but again, typically when we see garnet, we often see the, uh, uh, the pyrotite, not in this case. No, they're just granitic nice, no pyrotite. Uh, so here's one of these darker, more dense particles with the pyrotite that's non-reacting. And here's a, a darker particle that looks similar, but it's a different rock. It's a, a amphibolite, and there's no, no iron sulfides in that. Okay, so I want to talk about water. Um, of course, water is a very important factor in all of this. Uh, you, you need sufficient moisture for the oxidation of the uh, pyrotite to occur within the concrete. And as far as the source of water, what we've seen, you need that long-term exposure of uh, water from uh, an exterior source for this, for this problem to occur. There was some uh, it, people talking about early on that, well, you know, could it be the water uh, that's in the concrete to start with. Of course, you, you, know, you need water to uh, mix the concrete. And, or could it be water that's coming in from humidity in the basement? And when I, when I talked about the, um, uh, the, the floor slab cores and what we learned from that is one thing it showed is that, well, no, it's not due to just the water in the concrete or water from the basement because we saw virtually no distress in the cores taken from the floor slabs. Uh, now, someone might say, well, you know, usually the, the floor slab is better quality concrete than the walls. <clears throat> and in most cases, we did see a uh, little better quality in the floor slabs, but I have seen ones that are where the quality of the concrete and the, and the amount of uh, the water cement ratio, which I'll talk about here in a minute, was pretty similar to the, to the very similar to the concrete in the, in the walls, and it has the exact same aggregate, but there's virtually no distress uh, going on, and, and you see very little oxidation of the, of the pyrotite. Um, so, you know, if, if, if it was just from moisture in the concrete or moisture from in the, uh, in the atmosphere inside the, in, uh, the basement, you'd expect uh, the floor slabs to also be showing, showing that distress. But basically, the floor slabs just aren't being exposed to the same amount of moisture as the, uh, the foundation walls. Uh, the efflorescence on the interior wall surface, I kind of already talked about that being an indication of water uh, moving from the exterior concrete and then um, the water evaporating out on the interior surface and, and leaving behind those secondary deposits. We also already talked about moisture barriers and the, the importance of, uh, of the moisture barrier in, in keeping the water out of the basement. And as far as the quality of the concrete and, and the water cement ratio, and if you don't really understand what the term water cement ratio means, typically in a, a cubic yard of concrete, say you have 500 pounds of cement, <clears throat> typically takes about 250 uh, pounds of water, sometimes probably a little more, 260, 270, but if you had 250 pounds of water with 500 pounds of cement, 250 divided by 500 is 0.5, right? So that's a 0.5 water cement ratio. So your, your concrete that's in a um, uh, driveway or a sidewalk uh, is typically going to have a water cement ratio of that 0.5 or under. It should be about 0.45, and that's probably about a 4,000 or 4,500 PSI concrete. Well, for foundations, you only need 2,500 PSI, 3,000 PSI concrete. You can get 2,500 PSI uh, easily with a water cement ratio of, of 0 0.60 or even 0 0.65. Uh, so the water cement ratio is much higher in a foundation. Uh, and the way water cement ratio, the, the way that factors in is, is when that concrete dries, uh, the more water that was used in the mix, the more porous that concrete is going to be because that, that water evaporates out in these pores. Um, but there was a lot of, I've heard, I've heard people talk about, well, this, all, this whole problem had a lot to do with the, with the contractors because they added a lot of water to the concrete after it got to the site, which is probably the case. I mean, we've seen uh, water cement ratios as high as 
0.70 or 0.75, <clears throat> maybe even a little higher, which is, which is pretty high. Um, but like I said, the, wa the water spent ratios that you have in a, in a typical foundation are plenty high enough that you're going to get uh, moisture e easily moving through that concrete. Um, and we see, you know, on all foundations, we often see these the evidence of that uh, water moving through with um, uh, secondary posits on the interior surface. We also, when we're looking at these cores, we're also looking at um, secondary posits within the concrete because the, uh, most of these concretes have either air, either air entrained or have small little air voids in there. Um, and if water is moving through there, it's usually dis dissolving out uh, some of these soluble components and when the water, when, the, when that dries, those uh, components get uh, deposited in the air voids. So a lot of times we'll see high amounts of secondary deposits in the air voids, and uh, it's, it's an indication that there is water moving through that concrete. Okay, so of course you guys have all heard about this. There's a, you know, a major problem in, in Canada with pure tight, also in foundations and, and some other structures. Uh, their problem started about 10 years earlier than ours down here. Uh, but like I said, their, their rock is it's, it's, uh, a different rock type. Uh, they identify it uh, principally as an anorthosidic gabbro that also has mica in it. Um, and like I said, it's really, from, from what I understand, uh, you know, more uniform rock than what, what, we're, what we're seeing here. So particle to particle, it's, uh, it's more uniform. Um, they also have actually uh, much higher pyrite contents and in, in different parts of the quarry uh, have higher pyrite contents than other contents. And they, they typically find out that the higher the pyrite content is, the, uh, it's not mine, is it? Uh, the higher the pyrite content is, the more reactive that rock is. Um, and so generally pyrotite's more prone to oxidation than, than, than pyrite. Uh, now they've come up with a number, you've probably heard, 0.23% uh, of pyrotite by volume in the coarse aggregate. Uh, if you have, if they find out it's, a, it's above that, then they think there's a problem, a potential problem for uh, significant deterioration. Um, that amount's pretty low. Uh, like I said, when I did that analysis of the, uh, that point count, we got 3%, and, uh, but we, not all of the rock has pyrotite and some has lower amounts. But, but still, I mean, if we did that, uh, a measurement of the amount of pyrotite uh, in the rock, it, it's probably going to be at least 1% or 2% in some cases. Or, uh, so this, that number is actually pretty low that they've, they've come up with. And the, one other, other big difference was in their situation is the rate, uh, how quickly they started seeing distress. They started seeing you know, significant distress after only three to five years, and which is a much easier problem to deal with when in, in a situation here we're not seeing it so much, much later than that. You can get a kind of a, uh, a better handle on it. And um, you don't have to wait maybe 15 years before uh, you see significant problems. So they've done a, just a, a ton of research and, and testing up in Canada. Um, they've had access to the uh, quarries to get however much rock they want and do, do a lot of this testing. They have developed a, a mortar bar test that um, takes 100 and 80 days uh, to determine if they actually get some good information after 90 days after the initial portion uh, where they're doing it at a higher temperature to accelerate the, uh, the reaction and putting it in a bleach solution to, for the oxidation. Um, but then they do it at a lower temperature to try to get that, uh, that thomasite formed, uh, which, like I said, it well, actually forms at a, at a lower temperature. So, uh, But they desperately want to try to get some of our, the, the Connecticut aggregate the, from the Becker quarry to do testing on it because they want to find out, you know, are their tests valid not just for that aggregate but at other pyrotech containing aggregates. So I've been in contact with them for, for years and they've been asking down here with, with myself and other, other people and really, really want to try to get a hold of some of this, uh, this aggregate from the Becker quarry to, to do further research on 
Um, but it's, I, 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 like I said, I tried to get a, uh, a site visit set up for while I was out here, when, while I was out here, and it just doesn't, doesn't, I guess it's pretty hard to get into that quarry to, uh, to see it or to collect any, any, any rock from. Uh, so, actually, before I did that, um, that previous slide, I then, uh, uh, Dr. Benoit Fournier from Laval University sent me a presentation that he did, and he allowed me to use a few of his slides uh, just to show uh, the amount of, of testing they're doing. This is a, a foundation wall, and you can see the number of cores that they, they've taken out to, uh, to examine for uh, petrographically and to do testing on. Um, but not only are they looking at cores from foundations, uh, they're doing, they, like I said, they've got plenty of aggregate from these quarries. They're making concrete samples, um, putting them out in the, in the field. And since there is, like I said, is a, is a quicker reaction, in a few years they can start getting some information on, you know, um, is this concrete cracking? So they can maybe look at, uh, put the aggregate in at different water smit ratios, say, or different, different types of uh, concrete and see how it performs. Uh, with different situations, and so there's someone there is like measuring the uh, cracking. But like I said, they've also developed, uh, develop, develop, and developing some of these tests to determine if if you have an aggregate sample, you, you know, make it in the lab, do these tests, and see if it's expanding. Uh, the top picture shows a, a mortar bar being tested. They're also working on a concrete prism test with larger uh, concrete specimens, and then of course also doing the. Uh, the chemistry and the, and the petrography testing. So one other thing I think needs to be addressed is, are there other quarries out there that have reactive aggregate? Now some of these cores I'm getting in with these very low amounts of uh, reactive aggregate and reactive particles and, and pyrotite, you know, is it from Becker because the, the, the quarries changed over the years or is it possible that there's other quarries out there that have these lower amounts of, of reactive aggregate, and maybe they just haven't done much yet because we haven't seen, it hasn't been long enough because there's such a low amount of reactive aggregate. And what about other, other structures? Uh, there's been a lot of talk that people reporting that, but through our petrographic work, we're looking at that concrete all the time, that type of concrete, not from here, but other structures, and we see evidence of moisture moving through these concrete. So, you know, just because it has a, a 0.50 water spent ratio instead of a 0.70 water spent ratio, doesn't mean water's not getting into that concrete. So is it just possible that these structures just are taking much longer and maybe in another 10 years or 15 years we might start seeing significant, significant distress in some of these structures? So again, it's another thing that I, it, it seems to me that people should be looking into this. You know, Go take a couple cores from a, a couple bridge decks or, or pavements and, uh, and see if there's anything going on. I mean, yeah, we don't see anything on the, on the, the surface yet maybe, but once we look at it, um, under the microscope, is that it, we know the pyrotite's in there, we know the reactive rock's in there, is that pyrotite oxidizing and starting to show very you know, fine microcracks in the, in the concrete and, and will it get worse? Uh, I was out today and um, saw some sidewalks at a school where the, uh, the foundation definitely has the problem uh, and the sidewalks all show pattern cracking. It's very tight right now, but you know, it's, it's probably going to get worse over time. It's, it's already starting to crack, so there's Good chance there's other structures out there that are, that are going to be a concern in the future. This is my last slide. Uh, so development of standard tests for the Connecticut aggregate. So uh, can a standardized test method be developed that will determine if foundations will have a problem in the future? I think that's one thing that uh, needs to be looked at. Um, you, know, re lot like a, you know, just re research needs to be done to, uh, on this particular aggregate to, to look at these things. Also, uh, can a standardized test be developed that will determine if aggregate sources will react or expand in concrete? Kind of like what uh, Laval University is doing up in Canada. Get an aggregate sample, uh, mix it in some concrete in a mortar bar or a concrete prism test and test it and see if, see if it's going to expand, if it's going to be a problem. Um, you know, another thing, you know, can we develop a test where, and that's a lot of these newer foundations that aren't showing distress that may have uh, lower amounts of reactive aggregate. Can we take cores from those and run some, of, some, some sort of accelerated test on those cores to determine if that concrete's going to expand over time. Um, you know, so all these things are, are things that need to be looked at. Um, I, I was talking with the, uh, the people from the University of Connecticut uh, that are here today, and uh, they are going to be doing 
uh, some research uh, that they're funding uh, to try to look at, look at some of these things. Uh, but it, again, it's going to take, a, I think, a lot of, uh, over time, a lot of money needs to be funded to some of, some of these uh, programs to do some of this testing and, and answer some of, all, some of these questions that are still unanswered. Thank you. So uh, what we'll do is we'll have questions and, and answers and discussions at this time, but I, um, there's so many questions I'm sure people will have, so let's divide them into different groups of questions. The, the issue is um, that we need a gold standard. And in the absence of a defined gold standard of a test, uh, we have the petrographic analysis as the most likely gold standard because of the fact that this can allow us to look at the, the reactivity of uh, the peritite and, and the non-reactivity of the peritite as well. So that actually helps us because from what I understand what you just described, not all peritites are bad. If it's non-reactive, it's probably not as bad. And then some of the other tests cannot differentiate it. We've well, got to be careful about saying um, non-reactive versus reactive peritite. I mean, although some peritite, because of that chemistry difference, uh, may be a little more reactive than others, I mean, any peritite that's going to be exposed to the moisture and oxidation is going to react. So you can't really say non-reactive and reactive peritite, um, but in this, case is you can, in this case you can talk about non-reactive and reactive rock particles because some, some of the rock particles, again, have a different texture and mineralogy, and some of, those, some of that, that, that texture and mineralogy in some of the rock particles allows moisture in, and again, in some of these other rock particles, you have much denser, uh, you, have, you don't have some of the minerals in there, and it's a much denser, denser texture that's not really allowing the, uh, the moisture in. But, um, but again, one, one thing about the, you mentioned about the, just the petrography in general, I mean, unfortunately, I showed you what I'm doing, but, and, and if you send the, these cores to another petrographer, they might not be doing the, you know, that exact same thing, or they may not have the experience that I have as far as looking at over 300 cores and cores I know came from, from Becker uh, Quarry, um, but they may not, you know, they may try to de just determine a you know, report of, say, a percent pure type. Uh, so their report may be a lot different. So again, you know, maybe, I don't know if there's something that can be done where uh, things are looked at where all, any, any work being done petrographically can be, kind of be more standardized uh, for this particular situation. Possible. So, and I'll give you a practical example. Um, if um, a home gets tested and the false positive results based on the testing that's done, a false positive for the homeowner is equal to $200,000 less of their value. So this becomes an, an urgent issue uh, because if um, XYZ entity does a test, and, and that test has not been standardized based on working it and, and coordinating it with uh, the gold standard, if you will, then that's a challenge for the individuals. And, and, and how do we navigate for this very practical issue that's going to impact um, all the homes? Because some tests may just pick up pyrotite, even the smallest amount. Yeah, well, I mean... I'm assuming, and I, I'm assuming the question was going to come up, but, you know, regarding the, uh, the, the Trinity testing, I'm assuming you're kind of, kind of uh, getting at that um, and what they're doing. And, I, and I've, uh, this morning I actually was over at Trinity College and, 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 and discussing their method and what they're doing and, you know, trying to collaborate with them so they can kind of use my knowledge. I can try to learn, you know, kind of what they're doing. Um, you know, but they've come up with a, a unique method to... Uh, determine the percent pyrotite in the aggregate, which is going to be very beneficial if you get a very high number, uh, you know you probably have a problem. Uh, if, you, if, if they look at one of these rocks, uh, types of aggregate that really have no pyrotite, then they should get a you know, zero number, which is going to be good news. But just like my method, when I'm looking at and seeing these very low amounts of reactive rock, um, they're seeing these very low amounts of, of pure type, and we don't know yet if that's going to be a problem. So that's why, again, there needs to be a lot of research done to determine uh, some sort of standardized method of, of, of doing something where we, 
can say this is going to be a problem and, th and this is not. And I don't know if that, you know, is, is determining just by the percent pure tight. Like I said, unfortunately, uh, we've got this situation where some rocks seem to be uh, that, that contain pyrotite that just don't seem to be doing anything. Now, you know, in 50 or 60 years, may they do something? I, I don't know. I mean, 30 years, they, they haven't done anything. So uh, it's hard to say. But um, again, I just think, think more work needs to be done to really kind of figure out some of those, uh, uh, those situations where you have these low amounts of reactive rock or low amounts of pyrotite and figure out uh, if that foundation is going to have the stress in the future. So uh, I'll just one more question on this very topic, and then I'll open it up for the testing-based questions. Yukon is talking about X-ray spectroscopy. We have petrographic, and we have uh, another testing which is based on magnetic assessment. Um, this is a mess. Yeah. So, so we need to know what to do because uh, there are false positives and false negatives. I mean, that's, uh, that's going to have the impact on the individual's lives and, and, and so on. So I think it's worthwhile to, to have um, all of the experts sit in a room and then come up with a plan and, and at least acknowledge that there is one gold standard, and then we work our way back from that. Yeah. I, I, I bet the people may have an argument. Yeah. What is the when, gold standard? When you say um, X-ray spectroscopy, that's what what he's referring to is what I showed you with the SEM. That SEM, it's a scanning electron microscope um, with energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, and UConn is, is set up to be able to to do that type of work. But and I was kind of discussing with them, um, it's a great tool, but you also want to be able to look at the concrete. Uh, in, the, in the bigger picture first, because the SEM, you're looking at very small samples a lot of times at very high magnification. Um, you, you can get uh, to some lower magnifications also, but it's good to um, get those saw cut lap surfaces, uh, see what's going on, then zoom in, okay, this area we want to do a little more detailed analysis on and get chemistry, and then you go to the SEM. And, um, I, you know, I've kind of mention that to them, and I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully in the future um, I'll be involved with, uh, with their study so we can use my experience and their experience and, you know, try to work to, to get something that we can figure out. So there was a question here. I'll take that, and then I'll take a question. He started with Trinity. That's fine. Okay. He answered the Trinity question. Okay, it was a Trinity question. Did you want to make a quick comment on that? Nick, Tim Heim, I want to say thank you very much for, it was very knowledgeable on, on the presentation. So there's, just from my understanding, there's not two types of pyrotite. There's, it's the same pyrotite, just non-reactive, reactive in a different state. Is that correct? Yeah, it's all, it's all the same pyrotite. When I showed you those dark particles where you had those, uh, the, the small amount of, of pyrotite kind of dispersed out, that, that pyrotite yeah. is pretty much the same as the pyrotite in the, in the reactive rocks. It's just the reactive rocks have that garnet in there, the, um, the sliminite, more mica, and it's, it's the texture of it is allowing more moisture into that rock type. Thank you. So is there, with the non-reactive pyrotite, there's no guarantees that that will never become reactive. Is that accurate? I, yeah, I don't know that. There, like you said, there may be You no wouldn't guarantees. put that in writing. Yeah, no, it's hard to say. I mean, like I said, it, it's been... You know, these ones that I'm seeing, it's, it's, it's been 30 years already, and there's, there's nothing going on. I, who's, who's to say what's going to happen in the 60s? Because as that reactive pyrotite reacts and the cracks get bigger, it is p potentially possible that that non-reactive pyrotite could become reactive. Well, what happens in, in this concrete, because the, uh, the water spent ratio is so high, and when you get cracking in this concrete, it doesn't go through good quality aggregates. When we see... Uh, when I do no, uh, other petrographic work, um, say on a, just a general, say a crushed limestone coarse aggregate, and we're seeing, uh, say, free saw damage and the concrete's got cracks running all through it, those cracks will often go right through the aggregate particle because the cement paste is very hard and the, similar to the aggregate particles. So when that crack uh, goes through, the cement paste is hard enough that it goes right through the aggregate particle also. In this concrete, the water spent ratio is so high and the cement paste is so weak that when you get cracks in the paste, it just goes right around the coarse aggregate particles because these, these are very hard aggregate particles. So um, it's very unlikely that cracking caused by, by the reaction is going to um, open up these better quality aggregate particles that contain pure type. There was one hand here, and actually you can raise it again. Um, one quick question. Nick, I'd like to get clarification when we talk percentages. 
the Canadian slide said that a quarter of a percent roughly by volume of pyridite is a problem, a potential problem. Now, that's only one out of 400 when you talk a quarter of a percent. If you had 400 cubic feet of, of, yeah. of aggregate, one cubic foot would be pyrotite. Yeah, so they're, they're looking at they're, um, doing a percent of that coarse aggregate. So um, just like I showed you, some of those coarse aggregate particles, one, one particle is half, you know, 50% pure type. But, um, so they're just looking at the, of all the coarse aggregate, if you did like a, a, a point count and, and just looked at the, the pure type, if you took all the pure type out of all those rocks right. and, and that, that amount of pure type, the volume would be 0.23% of the total volume of the aggregate. Right, and we, you've been talking numbers like 25 and 30%. See, see it's totally different. Is the, that so a see, different you have, you have to way of measuring? Two totally different things. With percent pure type, and again, all this work that I'm doing, is I'm looking at the percent of the reactive rock particles. They're two different things, so you can't get those two confused. Percent pure type in the aggregate is totally different than the percent of reactive aggregate particles in the aggregate. So if I've got a, one of those sections I showed you, yeah. that is a 10 inch long section by four inches, if I count every aggregate particle in there, there's typically, well, if I do two cores, there's typically gonna be about 200 particles, 200 coarse aggregate particles. But as you saw from that picture where I crack mapped all the, uh, the, the, the cracks and I showed the X's on those reactive particles, yes. so I'm only counting those reactive particles. So if it's, if it's 50%, um, I would count, and, and there's 100 particles, half the particles would be reactive, okay? Okay, so it's a different uh, system of counting. Yeah, it's, 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 it's different, yeah. Oh. So it's, it's the amount of reactive coarse aggregate particles versus the amount percent pyrotite, the mineral pyrotite. So just a reminder, the standards we'll talk about in the next session of, of questions. We'll talk about the testing quickly, and I'll come to the standards in a second. You had a question on Hi, Nick. Um, Beggar's Quarry is still open, as you know. And I have a letter here um, addressed to Dr. Anwar from Becker's Quarry. He just did a site walk. And you and I talked about some of the uses from the material that they're using. They specifically put it in this letter. The material is used for drainage, road maintenance, road base, parking lot base, winter sand, asphalt, bedding sand, backfilling, driveway, and a number of other uses unrelated to concrete. Their article back in November, they said they used it for asphalt, road-based parking lots, and drainage projects. When I had spoken to you, you had mentioned that one of the things that I just enumerated, you had a little concern with that they were using the aggregate for that, and I just wanted to touch okay. base on that. Was yeah. that the road fill? You're talking as far as using, um, using the aggregate under, under roads for road pyrite, beds, yeah. and then they're putting concrete over, over top of that, or possibly asphalt. Yes. And um, I don't know if that's going to be a problem. I think it could be a potential problem. Uh, if moisture is getting to that, uh, the material under the pavement, uh, that base material can potentially expand and then cause cracking in the pavement. Uh, there's been other cases of, uh, of, of uh, I know when they used, uh, it was a shale that had pyrite in it that was used for base material underneath slabs and that expanded and caused a lot of cracking. This was another Canadian project that's separate from, from this issue. Um, so there's that, that a potential issue there, but I, I don't know if that would cause a problem. It's just something that should be looked into and could possibly uh, cause some problems with some, if it's being placed under the pavements. It happened in Ireland. It was called Ireland. Yeah, yeah, definitely in Ireland, yep. A question on testing? I'm not sure this is a proper question, but uh, just a generalist question. In the academic literature, how early or at what date did people begin to report on this as a problem? I'm sorry, I missed the first part. In the academic literature, at what date did people begin to, specialists begin to recognize this as a problem? Yeah, good question. I don't know the answer to. Debbie probably does because she's done all the research. But I mean, <laughs> What's that? 1970s. 1970s. There, yeah, there's been, uh, yeah, one thing in the, in the U.S. here, Are you this really me? is the first time we've seen this type of problem in the U.S. with a specific pure type uh, igneous rock where it's causing this type of distress. Um, 
there, like I said, if, if you look in the research, you'll see places in Spain and I think Argentina and some of these different countries where they've had this problem. And as Debbie said, it probably was reported first in, in the and, 70s. And my other question, just to go along with that, uh, if someone were to send to your company, they uh, ask you to do the two borings and then analyze it and do your reporting, what's the cost that they should pay? Okay. Uh, we, our typical cost to do a petrographic examination on a concrete core is about $1,500 per core. Uh, but what I've done with these situations is um, kind of done a, a scaled down report and really just looking at what the homeowner is really looking for as far as do they have reactive aggregate, how much reactive aggregate's in there, is there a cracking and how much cracking and, and, and reporting on the, um, uh, the asphalt uh, if they have a, a, a moisture barrier. Uh, and that cost is running anywhere from uh, $800 to $900 per core. Uh, so for two cores, typically $1,600, $1,700 around there. How long does it take? Well, it used to take about three to four weeks. Um, but, I'm, of course, with this work, it's uh, making me extremely busy. I mean, I'm, I'm extremely busy with all of my petrographic work right now. It's just kind of a busy time. I've got a lot of big projects. But then... With this, all, all these petrographic cores coming in from for the, the pyrotite issue, I'm much busier. Uh, I typically have been telling clients um, up to eight weeks, but usually six or seven weeks to get a report out. And if anyone out here, if I have cores from, from, from their home, the reason I don't have a report out yet because I had to spend all the time getting ready for this presentation. So, <laughs> But, yeah, it's, it, it can run up to eight weeks, but typically six or seven weeks right now. I, yeah, I don't. That's additional. Yeah, we don't do anything with taking the cores. Um, that's done by others, and they send the cores to me. I have a question about the um, the cracking coming from moisture. You said something about having water needs to get to it. So there could be homes that are well drained and well sealed on the outside, have peritite in there foundations but won't have a problem then because the moisture is not getting to it? Yeah, that's a good question uh, because in all these older homes, like I said, from the early 80s and, and even early 90s, um, we saw either no moisture barrier or poor quality moisture barrier, so they're all getting moisture in. I have seen situations where some of these newer homes, some that are even not that much newer, but 20 years old that have react a, a high amount of reactive coarse aggregate and there's really not much going on. And those, they did have a good quality moisture barrier, and I'm assuming they probably have good drainage around their home. Uh, but, and there's, there also was not really much evidence of secondary deposits uh, of moisture moving through that concrete. So yeah, there, there, there could be situations where you have a high amount of reactive aggregate with the concrete staying dry, and you won't have distress because you absolutely need moisture to drive this reaction. Now, one thing you have to, to think about is it's, it's not, getting moist now, is, is that situation going to change over time? You know, I, I don't know. Well, my second part to that question is then, wouldn't it make sense with the state reimbursing people for core testing, if they had any concerns, if their homes were built in that time, if the owners would test their own concrete and find out if they have any peritite, and if they do, put money into sealing their home and putting drainage is a whole lot cheaper than replacing a foundation. Yeah, I don't know what that, it's still a pretty big uh, project and some of the, if Don wants to speak up or something, I don't know, but the, you'd still have to excavate around the whole exterior of your home. Oh yeah, but it's right? cheaper than a foundation. And, and, uh, yeah. and seal that up, but um, I don't know what, I don't know how much that is, but it's, it's something that It's a that whole lot be, cheaper than a yeah. brand oh, new yeah, foundation. Oh yeah, I'm sure it is. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to summarize about the testing. From what I understand on the testing is that there are multiple ways of testing. We don't have standardization at this time. The responsibility of the concrete family, I use this loosely, including the legislators and, and the payers and the state and the municipalities and the insurers maybe, um, they're not in the family completely yet, um, <laughs> that we need to have a, a standardized testing which actually would be something that would be correlate with each other and then talk to each other and it would cost uh, less and more efficient. Yeah. Yes. I'm Mike Accorsi, Associate Dean of Engineering from UConn. I, um, in the interest of time, we put together a one-page summary. Uh, this talks about the work we've done in the past and the work we're planning to do in the 
coming year, and the work in the coming year is really focused on validation and standard standardization of testing. We'll be working with uh, Nick. We'll be working with Trinity. We'll be working with the Canadians. Um, so that's really where we're heading this year. Um, and all that work is being funded internally by the University of Connecticut, um, and we're looking forward to trying to develop solutions to this problem. And there are handouts actually on this very topic in the, in the back if, if you've already not picked that up, but, but thank you so much. This actually answers the first set of questions that we had. The second set of questions is about the standardization. Uh, right now, um, the state of New York has made a decision that in their quarries they have agreed to a 1% acceptance of pyrotite or pyrotite-like material. And, and, and how they came up with that is not known, but that's the aggregate amount that they have agreed to. And, and um, the aggregate um, standard is different from the, the concrete standard. And the concrete standard, at least uh, Canadian data, is 0 0.23 or so. Um, can we use the existing data and do um, know what is this based on? And can some of that information help us to standardize our numbers? Uh, no, I'm not sure what that's that's based on. But are you sure it's not um, that one percent is not um, sulfur or in, in the aggregate and not and not pure type? It is one percent iron sulfide. Okay. No, I'm not sure where New York came up with that. Um, but like I said, unfortunately, this aggregate is I think is, is so unique that you know we really need to do testing on on this particular aggregate to try to determine. Uh, what limits we need to uh, need to set, but yeah, he said it was. It's a, a self science, science. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so again, th they're basing it on some data, but but we have to figure out, uh, and 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 we this can probably land us into how do you assess the quarries? Is there a standard across Connecticut or or beyond where you actually assess every quarry because prevention is better than figuring out what to do? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and I, yeah. And I kind of already talked about that, right? Okay. As but, far as yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm getting for the legislators in the room that this is an area that that needs to be to looked at as well. So, from a standardization point of view, um, what can what data can we use from Canada? You have said that there are two the the Canadian material or or pyrotite is different than what we are seeing over here. Yeah. So, um, so that data would not necessarily be as useful as we would have expected? Well, I think we can you know, definitely look at what they've done and, and, and try to learn from what, what they've done. Um, but like I said, I, I definitely think you know, we need individual testing in, in this case. And like I said, they, they are, are very willing to work also with us and, and look at this particular aggregate. And, they, and like I said, they want to get the, the samples of the aggregate um, to do their own testing, and uh, because they've already, you know, they've done, like I said, a, a ton of research, and they've already got some of these test methods in place. So, you know, if they can get um, large quantities of the uh, the aggregate down here and just get right into their their testing on it, and these test methods they, they've already developed, it, you know, we can probably it'd probably be very beneficial. I think. Okay. Yes. I can ask. I can ask. Well, I, I can ask because I asked him to visit the site, and he was gracious to let me visit the site. But I asked to to pick some samples, and he wasn't ready at that time. <laughs> <laughs> so I will ask. Yeah, yeah. I, I will ask. It, it's easy enough to call, and 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 uh, the way I approach this was in a very simplistic manner. I know that nobody wakes up in the morning feeling that they want to hurt communities or anybody. So in a way, we are all victims who have been impacted, but they are also victims as well. So we need to figure out that what is the future and what can be done to prevent more people to be impacted. And I think that's how I approached it, and, and he opened the door to let me in and ask questions. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, so the, the other aspect is that we are also seeing in Connecticut five-year time for some of the, the homes or, or the structures to have crumbling. So I think that is part of the challenge as well. That is some similar to what was seen in Canada. Well, yeah, they, um, I know, like I said, they, 
have seen significant distress in, in three to five years. From all the cores that I received, I've not seen any, any evidence of any um, real significant distress uh, occurring that early. I think it's definitely uh, takes longer with this aggregate in this situation for whatever reason. Again, those aren't known yet, but it seems to me there is a longer timeline uh, from the time the concrete's placed to the time they get significant distress relative to the Canadian concrete. Okay. And, and um, another question is, uh, I don't see any hands right now, so I can quickly ask you a few more questions. We, as we fix and, and, and some of these, uh, these foundations, what should be done with the concrete that is removed? What is the safe way of using this? Because that will be a lot of concrete that will come through, and, and we really don't want it to be used again in homes. So um, what should be the mechanism? Is, should, should there be a law to, to try and direct and, and, and custody, chain of custody, and the yeah. process for that? Well, yeah, it, it's, it's very obvious that you should not use that concrete as recycled aggregate in new concrete, which, they, which is done in some cases. They, they take crushed concrete and they crush it up into aggregate size and they use it as recycled aggregate in concrete. It's not real common, but it is done. But it's, like I said, it's very obvious that that should not be done in this case. I mean, assuming it's going to go to some landfills somewhere, um, I don't know what, how, you know what's being done with this concrete, um, uh, but you know, if it's all being put in, in, in one place, I mean, there is a possibility that you, you, know, you could have some problems with drainage running that's running through that concrete, um, and if there's if streams nearby, you can get acid runoff, you can get sulfuric acid, similar to uh, what they uh, have in, in coal mines where they have acid mine drainage. Uh, we've got um, problems with uh, the sulfates um, from the oxidation of the, of the pyrotite getting into streams, and you have problems with uh, uh, fit killing uh, of the fish and, and lowering of oxygen in the stream. So, but I don't know if that would ever really occur in a situation. You'd have to have a situation where you have a lot of that aggregate, you know, right near a stream or something like that. But I'm not okay. sure if there's going to be a potential problem. Sure. And, and as I walk over there, if, as we are trying, as people are pouring concrete, there needs to be some specific standards that are well identified. Is there opportunity for manipulating the pH of that mixture to reduce the risk of oxidation? Because the pH has been something that people have looked at too. I mean, concrete has a by, na by uh, the na uh, nature of the Portland cement has a very high pH. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to with regard to the pH, but uh, the pH of concrete is uh, of the cement pH of the concrete is anywhere from 12, uh, 12 to 13, so it's, it's very high. Um, that pH gets as oxygen uh, on the surface of the concrete reacts. That pH does reduce over time. But I don't think there's any really connection between the pH of the concrete and, and what's going on. I mean, a any concrete you make is going to have a high pH just because that's the chemistry of the Portland cement. So there's not really anything you can do really to say, well, we want the pH to be much lower. Um, it, it is what it is, and that's, that's nothing, nothing to do I, I think the sulfuric acid development and, and, and the vicious cycle risk is, is what people are theoretically talking about. Well, again, there's not, like I said, it's just... No, no. Um, the, it's the, theoretical. The, it's already, it is what it is, yeah. I think, for the pH of the concrete. Um, would it be helpful to collect the concrete that we know, for anybody who's getting a foundation replaced, collect that concrete so you guys can get a bigger database of what the bad concrete and aggregate looks like? So all these houses that are getting replaced concrete get samples, use it for your research, collect it, log it, do something yeah. with it, instead of throwing it away. But not, not every lab has it. Like if you're going to start this new group and you need to build a database, it, instead of throwing it away, just collect it. I mean, somebody should be gathering information from it. It should be logged. Someone. Even if you use it later. Well, I don't have room in my basement, but somebody other than me should collect it and log it. There should be an address, a town, yeah. something. You should be able to use it at now or yeah, later. Yeah, that's something that, you know, someone like maybe the University of Connecticut, if they wanted to, to look at a high number of cores or something, you know, maybe able to use uh, cores for that type of information. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a good idea, potentially. Yeah, I was just, I I'm, I'm curious as a layman. There's a follow-up on this one. I'm real quick. Oh, I'm sorry. I just, I just want to say from the University of Connecticut's perspective, we are going to be contacting install people who are doing replacements and asking for some of that material. We plan to work up and, up and going. This, our program is just 
really in the infancy. It's only about 48 hours old right now. <laughs> so uh, we got to walk before we can run, but I do plan on reaching out to the folks. Oops. We do plan on re reaching out to the uh, different people who are doing the replacements and trying to secure some of that materials so that we will have that to be able to use as part of our study. So, Just as a layman, I'm not a geologist, but tell me why the Romans can have concrete standing for 2,500 years and not have any collapse. Is it due to the soup, the mixture they're having? Is it pumice? What is it? Yes. If that's the case, why don't you study that to find out? Oh, believe me, a lot, a lot of people have, and, and it's, a good, it's a good question. But, um, yeah, that, that was made with the, the – they weren't uh, using a, a, it was a more of a natural cement, not the, the Portland cement uh, that we're using now. But, I mean, there's – we can make concrete right now that can, can last a very, very long time. But, um, but no, I, I'm not – I know, but there's – I have any direct knowledge of it, but there's, there's people that have been – studying how those concretes are made and, and, and researching that. But. No, I understand it's an economic issue, but what's the cost to replace $6 billion worth of foundations just in the state of Connecticut? It'd be a lot less expensive if these concrete manufacturers studied what actually works. Yeah. Unfortunately, like I said, this, this problem wasn't really known in, in the U.S., and um, unfortunately there's nothing really uh, in the codes that say a, a quarry has to have their aggregate tested. This aggregate, you know, if this aggregate would have been tested, you know, 30-some uh, years ago or 30 years ago or whatever, uh, someone and someone that knew what they were looking at might have thrown up a red flag and say, hey, this aggregate has quite a bit of pyrotite in here. I'll, you know, maybe we should do some testing to see if it can be used in concrete. Unfortunately, um, again, there's no actual requirements. For certain projects, there might be project by project. So if they were using that concrete for a large project, a state project or something, that whoever's um, building that structure may require them to do tests on the aggregate. But for residential homes, that's never going to, you know, it's just not, not in the uh, requirements. Just one final question. I'm sorry. What happens if there's a catastrophic failure of a bridge? Will that get the attention of the federal yeah, I'm, government? I'm, I'm, I'm sure it would. Absolutely. Yeah. See, on a uh, constructive note, perhaps... Um, Here's a thought. It's generally acknowledged that water is a required ingredient here to oxidize this pyrotite. Uh, most homes have uh, waterproofing up to the soil level. It leaves about two feet or so of the foundation exposed uh, without waterproofing. Uh, why not just waterproof that? Wouldn't that help keep water out of the foundation using, um, you know, a, a clear silicone type waterproofing? Uh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it would, that would help. Um, the uh, you can get moisture in, uh, some moisture in from just from rain and things like that. But but for the most part, on a on a vertical surface. Uh, when that concrete gets wet from rain or snow or whatever, um, you don't get as much penetration because it gets wet at the surface and it kind of dries out, back out. Um, so it is definitely more that that water, the groundwater is just collecting and just sitting there against the wall for long periods of time that it's getting in. So it's definitely more uh, severe of a situation than stuff that's below grade. I mean, it, it could possibly help some to do it above grade. But one, one thing I thought of when you were talking about that is someone might say, well, why do you have uh, so much distress? Why do you see all that cracking in the concrete above grade? And, uh, and, and the answer to that is, is, is concrete is very much like a sponge. I mean, it will absorb water, and that water, if the, uh, if the concrete down here is wet and the concrete up here is dry, just like when you same thing as you do with a sponge. You put water in that lower part of the sponge, and this part up here is dry. That water is going to mig migrate up to the top of that sponge. It does the same thing in concrete. So that top, that concrete that's on, uh, on the exposed portion, that water is migrating up and um, getting that portion of the concrete uh, soaked also. And we, and we know this because we've seen evidence this in, in other things where we have um, sulfate in the soils uh, that – those, those materials get into the concrete, and we see them wick up, and we see uh, deposits on the, on, on the upper part of the wall that's, that's exposed above. So it's, it's a very common issue. So, so there's... How do you explain the difference between the 
floors. The floor slabs apparently don't have the problem, whereas the walls do. Is that the floor slab is drier? Yeah. I think the only way you're going to get a lot of moisture coming from the bottom of the floor slab is if you have a high wa- – if you're in an area that has a very high water table. If your water table is low enough, then the moisture is not going to get into that, into that slab. Whereas in the wall situation, all of the water that's – you know, falling into the ground um, goes down and then just kind of builds up against the uh, the foundation wall. So it's just a difference in the environment and uh, where the where the water is and that concrete not getting exposed to water. So I'm just going to add a quick little thing. On that one issue, I think there's also much better consolidation uh, and working of a floor slab compared to a foundation wall for residents. Usually, uh, if if you watch a residential concrete contractor placing concrete, they just dumped in the forms. Uh, I, I see all this honeycombing. I see gaps in the surface where that concrete was not consolidated, which leaves it open and much more susceptible to moisture intrusion, whereas a slab has to be finished. It has to be screeded. It has to be floated, and it has to be troweled, so you wind up with a much denser concrete. So if, if a slab is going to be affected, number one, it's going to take a lot longer because of that working. And it's just not as susceptible as uh, walls are. Yeah. Um, just to uh, comment on that, I don't know. I, I, I don't completely agree with that. Even though you see some uh, honeycombing and voids on the on the exterior of the wall, remember they're, they're they're putting a lot of water in this concrete. They're pouring in. It's very flowable. Um, so when I see the concrete throughout, it's these cores are usually typically pretty well consolidated throughout the length of the, of the core. You may have some consolidation issues on the outside. And as far as the, um, the finishing on the, on the surface of the floor, you're right. They do do a little more finishing, so you have a little bit of a denser top surface. Um, but down below, that concrete is probably similar uh, to a wall, and, that, and that's where the water is coming from. It's coming from below. It's not coming from the top where the concrete is, uh, is more densified. Yeah, sir, I agree with that, and I would, I would also add that most of the slabs we put down since the late 70s have, have been put on 6 mil poly. So, you know, yeah. that, tends to, that tends to impede that, 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 uh, that migration. The, the question I have for you, Mayor, is wh- why don't you call Public Works, have them deliver three yards of that material to your yard, and take whatever sample they want out of it? <laughs> In our town, we are doing some things like that. Okay. But, um, pardon me? Um, for, for our town, you mean? For the, the homes that are... Uh, no, we, we actually, they're talking more interested in, in, in the, the quarry. But the quarry is not in this town. Not for residential. I don't think they give it for residential since 2015. Well, but what, I think what he's saying is, as a, as a township that that maybe uses aggregate and, and concrete, you can actually order. Say, I need two tons of aggregate because I want to. I want it for a, a parking area or something like that. Order, you know, order a bunch of aggregate and you have a big stockpile of it there. Then Christoph can come over and, and grab some aggregate, and University of Connecticut can come over and grab some aggregate, and. Uh, Yeah, you have to pay for it, but but aggregate is not that expensive. Um, follow up on the uh, to to follow up on the moisture barrier. Sometimes you do have the uh, the moisture barrier underneath a, a floor slab, but most of the uh, and we saw that in, in, in some cases. But more often than not, it's just that that those basement slabs are placed on crushed stone. So typically, you just see a crushed stone base material. I, I just want to share one anecdote from, that one of the victims had shared with me that they actually had uh, the same amount of peritite in the different samples, but one of the walls that actually had uh, minimal humidity it was on the inner side did not have any uh, cracks. And, and so this sort of uh, speaks to the, the fact that you can have the peritite, but if you don't have the moisture, that the rate of destruction is not going to be as fast, at least from that one little anecdote that we can look at that. Um, there's a few more questions. Yes, Mike. We heard testimony at the legislature from people who make concrete for foundations and stuff that they prefer boring aggregate. They prefer really boring rock. And that this rock was so interesting, they probably wouldn't have used it. It was so veined and had so many different minerals. Today I heard um, the woman com- describing the slides as saying that the slide of Becker's was poor quality aggregate. So even if Becker could make the claim that they didn't know the pyrotite would explode the concrete, they 
they did know, if they know concrete, that this was poor quality aggregate from the start. Yeah. If this aggregate, but you, what you don't understand is, if this aggregate did not have the pyrotite in it, it would be, even though it's an aggregate that, based on the, uh, the mineralogy and texture, is allowing uh, uh, more moisture in than these, some of these other types of aggregate, it's, it was good enough quality to be used in concrete. I mean, there's a lot of aggregates. Uh, most igneous rocks are, are typically uh, better quality than, say, some, some of these, uh, maybe some sandstones or some, some lower quality limestones that are highly absorptive. Um, so, no, I think if this, if this exact aggregate had no pyrotite in it, it would be sufficient quality for use in concrete. So. Um, can I ask the, the people who are academicians on, around this area if they can actually raise their hands who are with, you know, affiliated with the university? Yes. Two, three, four, five. Any more? Anyone else? Okay. Uh, I, I, would you guys make sure that you exchange cards by the end of our conversation? I, I, I know many of you already have, but if you have not, please exchange your cards. That would really be helpful. And uh, one more thing. Um, there are some legislators here. May I ask you guys to please stand up? You've been here, and we appreciate you being here. And, and uh, whether you're municipal, state, um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your leadership for, for being here and being part of this. Thank you. I, I know we have the mayor of Vernon. Are there other uh, uh, municipal leaders here, please? And, and municipal? Um, uh, Summers. Summers as well. If you want to stand up too, please, if you don't mind. Thank you so much. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're, uh, I think the municipalities and the state, this is, again, as, as I talk about the family, I want you to realize that we have truly been functioning as a family. And all families have dis dysfunctionalities, which is beautiful. <laughs> but, but, but we've been working as a family because we have been working as municipalities, the community, the state regis the legislators and activists. And, and, and this is what it's going to take to solve this. And, and academics coming in the picture is going to truly be the answer. Answer, but but uh, we are uh, we are we are committed. All of the people have been committed to take care of this. Um, if uh, nobody has any question, I want uh, Debbie. You want to take uh, to the conclusion and, and the final remarks as well, and your questions. Um, I would just like to thank you all again for coming out today to meet with um, Nick Scaglione. I'd like to thank the woman in my woman's working group, Marianne Coindus, the Concrete Queens. I'd like to thank all of them for helping me raise the funds to get Nick here. Um, I did have a question, though, for you, Nick, on the acidic runoff. Um, we had wrote to DEEP and wanted to ask them a question on the, um, the mine phases at the Beckers. Is there a concern about the acidic runoff from the um, exposed parotite? So that was one last question yeah, that, I would like to ask. That would probably be you. something for an, an environmental geologist to uh, to go over there, um, uh, maybe a hydrologist, and uh, take a look at the situation and, and see if there are any uh, any potential issues. Um, it really have to. It, it, it could be, but there may also not be. It depends on the environment and uh, where the where the water is running and all that. So it's something that yeah that, that if it. Needs to be looked at. It's something that some geologists Is that do. something where DEP could go to Becker's Quarry? And what is DEP? DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection. Gotcha. For yeah. We've written a letter to them, yeah. and we've asked them to open an investigation into the acidic runoff. And I'm just wondering if they can get a foot in the door at Becker's, maybe scoop up a little aggregate on the way out, is all I'm saying. Just saying. No, I'm, I'm sure that's some, someone in that organization would be able to take a look at that. Okay. Well, I do want to thank you all for coming today. Thank you all. Thank you. I just uh, wanted to mention we have uh, representatives from uh, Congressman Courtney's office, Congressman Larson's office, Senator Murphy's office, and then Senator um, Blumenthal's office as well, and from Krog. So thank you. Thank you, everyone.